It's 10 a.m. and folks are trickling in, which is wonderful. Hi, everybody. So good to see you this morning. Um, anyway, so I think we are going to have, again, a wonderful program today. <laughs> it was funny. Uh, as I was preparing for this program yesterday, I was doing it in the middle of the day and I was um, eating some lunch and that was a bad idea because I was trying to uh, talk about or try to write about dissections and all kinds of things. And I was like, this was bad timing. <laughs> so anyway, um, but it's going to be so much fun. We've got some really interesting things planned and some different folks are going to talk to us. And I know a lot of people have interest in this, so it's, it's going to be great. Just a couple housekeeping things. Um, I think everybody, well, first of all, if anyone, if it's your first time, welcome. So happy to have you. Uh, I think you're going to enjoy this program. Just a couple notes. We are actually, I'm so sorry to have to cancel, but we're not going to have a program next week because it's, it's kind of exciting. Um, I'm on the uh, search committee for the Society of American Archivists is looking for a new executive director. And so it's a big national search and we've got some very very long, extensive interviews that are going the next couple weeks. And unfortunately, one of them is going to be um, next Wednesday. So I'll have to cancel, but we'll resume the following week, which is going to be really exciting. I've got a surprise for you all on the, the week after. It's going to be really, really fun. And then I, again, this makes me kind of sad, but it's also necessary. Our, our last program for the semester is going to be on May 12th because I do need some time during the summer to really um, work on some collections management things and work on my upcoming fall exhibit. But we are going to resume the programs in fall. We're just going to take the summer off. So kind of sad, but um, but I think that's it's for the best so that I can produce more wonderful programs. And hopefully by then we can all attend the exhibit opening we're gonna have. Um, I'm hoping uh, we're gonna, it's, uh, the new exhibit is the Bentley Rare Book Museum's 35th anniversary. So for those of you who have been, um, or have been interacting with the Bentley Rare Book Museum formally, the Bentley Rare Book Gallery, we'll get a chance to celebrate all the wonderful memories that we have made um, in this space. So anyway, it'll be worth it, but I just wanted to let you all know that's why. But of course, I'll be here all summer. So if you want to come see me or you want to, you know, want to email or get a tour of anything where I'm here. Um, so anyway, we will go ahead and get started with our Where's Andrew uh, segment. Andrew looking quite dapper today. Um, okay, so... Interesting. Okay, so this one is going to have something to do with medicine. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So this is going to be hard because we have to, our, this is going to be hard because there, it could be anywhere. And so mm -hmm. um, let's, let's go ahead and first figure out, is this in the United States or is it outside of the U.S.? Definitely outside the United States. Okay. So we're definitely outside... We're somewhere in Europe, right? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say we're, um, I have two guesses. I'm gonna say it's either Italy or England. It's Neither. No, oh, okay. <laughs> I, was, I was like certain one of those would be correct. <laughs> um, Is it at an institute? of medicine? It's actually at a university. It does have a medical school, but okay. it has more to it than just medicine. Gotcha. Is it in, is it in France? No. Oh. Um. My big clue here is keep in mind the technicalities of what England constitutes. Is it Germany? No. Scotland? Yes. Ooh, Morgan. Yeah. Okay, hone in for the kill, Morgan. Keep going. <laughs> University of Edinburgh? Yes, it is. Oh. Totally random it is, guess. It is the Playfair Library. One of the most famous Scottish surgeons, Robert Whiston, attended the University of Edinburgh. 
along with Charles Darwin, James Clark Maxwell, and Joseph Wister, and Alexander Graham Bell. Oh, wow. Great guest, Tamara. And, you know, I thought that one was going to take us forever because it's like you have the whole world where it could be. This is, oh, that very, I didn't, I had no idea they had alumni like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but not surprised. Um, very, very exciting. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, and, Okay, and of course, Andrew made a wonderful handout for us, um, which is in the chat. So feel free to download that. Thank you again. So while Andrew's already talking, um, I think it would be, I'm really excited because when I, the reason why, first of all, when I, when I thought about this topic, I immediately thought of Andrew because I guess it was like mm, maybe in 2019 or um, early 2020 before the pandemic, Andrew gifted me with a, a book called Quackery that he is holding up. And it's, uh, I showed it to Morgan as well. Morgan is our, our, one of our interns. And it's all about crazy uh, medical remedies that people have attempted or believed um, throughout history, which is really, really interesting. And it's just, I mean, it's funny for us to kind of laugh at it, although, you know, who knows what people will be laughing at us for <laughs> in, um, in uh, hundreds of years. But Andrew is also a collector of medical texts and medical books which is great. So he's going to show us some items from his collection. And he's also going to pull out some blurbs from quackery that are just, uh, a, you know, too good to pass up. Uh, so anyway, Andrew, do you want to go ahead and then start? Sure. Going to share the screen. Can everyone see it? Yes. So first of all, I do want to point out just talk a bit about quackery here. A lot of the stuff I'll be talking about today does come directly from this book. Um, and it is a very good book. I will be, I tried to make this, I'm trying to the best way to put this, PG-13. Uh, <laughs> it's, I'm not going off the rails here. Um, I think mom can hear me, which is why I'm not gonna do that. Um, <laughs> So the first person I want to talk about is actually Robert Weston. Um, he did attend the University of Edinburgh and was a very highly regarded surgeon before anesthetics. Um, he was known as the fastest knife in West End, which is very important because you want your surgery to be over very quickly if you're not under anesthesia. However, he also had some very infamous cases and one of these is recounted in Quackery. Give me just a second to find the page. Andrew, if, I don't like the way he's holding the knife, but looking at somebody else. I feel like he's not paying attention to this. And that's actually what the story is about, is a lack of attention. Uh-oh. Another time, Wilson accidentally cut off the fingers of his assistant, who often held the wagon twice during the procedure. One of the onlookers dropped dead from terror when the knife slashed close enough to cut his throat, his coat. Unfortunately, the patient died. The poor assistant also later died of an infection from finger amputation, and thus Weston became the proud surgeon who can now boast a stunning 300% mortality rate from one surgery. Oh no. So that is why he made a very important point of the background today. Oh goodness. Um, one of my favorites is personally for Weech. It is definitely a classic example of a medical blunder. Um, it has been used as far back as the ancient Egyptians, and they historically served a variety of purposes, including the removal of evil spirits, which personally they seem like the evil one in this case, and they've also been used to help with hearing loss, strangely. The most common type is the European medical leech, which has 10 stomachs and three jaws, the three jaws leave a distinct bite mic that looks like the Mercedes-Benz logo. So you'll never see that the same again. Um, they also actually divide it up into 32 separate segments, and each segment has its own brain. So these are very unique creatures. Um, this example is actually from 1889 and is out of the Smithsonian. They became especially common in medicine in the early 1800s, and a high point of the 1830s. One of the most difficult and 
payable task in medicine, medicine is actually the highest in leeches, um, which is also recounted in the book. The book has a massive chapter on leeches if you want any more info and do, and do not want to sleep at night. Um, we just want to acquire a leech. At the turn of the 19th century, poor English children would wade into murky fresh water and so the leeches cling to their legs for pocket money. But soon, leeches became scarce. Even baiting your fish line with chunks of liver did no good. Ooh. And later continues by saying, soon, heridoculture, or leech farming, are most meat for the demand. At these leecheries, cows, donkeys, and decrepit horses were driven into muddy waters or marshes, sometimes slashed with cuts to encourage feeding. Now, the leech is obviously not a lovely part of medicine. However, they're actually still used today, strangely, by legitimate doctors. The reason for that is they're actually great at pinpointing specific areas and sucking out blood just in that one spot, and they help improve blood flow. So they actually still save a good purpose. I feel they're just like not I would want a choice on whether or not I had a, a leech treatment. I don't... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It does not seem pleasant. I hope I never have to experience that. <laughs> now, I won't be going into much details behind this one, but ground-up mummies were also often used as medicine, taken orally. The idea was that if you had ground-up mummy head, it could cure headaches, ground-up foot could cure foot pain, and so forth. Um, it was known as mummy yuck, it was described as being very bitter and unpleasant to take, which is a nice bit of reassurance sort of reassuring though. Um, eventually the supply of ancient Egyptian mummies actually ran low, so traders had to turn to the corpses of travelers who perished in the desert. Ooh. Medieval scientists sometimes found it difficult to distinguish between real mummies and recently harvested mummies. So essentially sometimes mummies are hard to find or hard because people ate them too much? Yes, oh my because yes. Like the tomb robbers of ancient Egypt would go after the gold and stuff, eventually for mummies, because it has no value. Later in medieval times is when they began to be used as medicine, which is why ancient Egyptian mummies are just so annoyingly rare. And unfortunately, I don't know it, who this mummy was. This, I believe, is from the Smithsonian. Trepanation is the world's oldest form of surgery. It comes from the Greek word trepanon, meaning to drill or boil, which is a pretty good description of what it is. It involves drilling into the skull to remove excess fluid, and it dates back as much as 10,000 years ago. Um, it was actually rather successful, and a lot of the trepanation skulls that have been found, actually the skull healed around, the, around their pole, so it clearly had a big success of it. But it's not, doesn't really serve much of a practical purpose. But it was eventually replaced by a globotomy. It's sort of a spiritual successor to drilling a hole in the head. In the 1770s, physician Franz Mesmer was inspired by a, by a priest named Maximilian Hell. And as you can imagine, Maximilian Hell took great pressure and referring to himself as Father Hell. Father Hell would take magnetic rocks, rocks and rub them on patients in an attempt to cure the patients. Mesmer was amazed, you might even say mesmerized, and decided every living being had a magnetic fluid inside it and that all disease was caused by an excess or lack of fl this fluid. He called this animal magnetism, which is a very ridiculous name, but eventually became known as mesmerism after Franz Mesmer. Mesmer eventually adapted his theory slightly. Eventually he claimed that only he could cure animal magnetism problems. But magnets were not required. He just had the magic touch or magnet touch, you say. Um, he also shifted the idea of being a magnetic fluid in people to sort of an invisible force, um, very much like the force in Star Wars. In fact, this basically is the force in Star Wars. Eventually, the French Academy of Science determined there was, in fact, no magnetic force 
bound the universe together and created nine excellent movies. Um, but Mesmo had already become popular enough to give us a word named after him, Mesmerize. So even though this was a terrible idea of medicine, it still lives on today in some form. So what time period was this again? The 1770s and till we have seven, 1830s, sort of. Oh, okay. Wow. So, in, oh, interesting. Phrenology is another weird one. This one, I have to admit, is not covered in quackery. This one I had to turn to other sources. Um, phrenology was devised by Joseph Gall, who theorized that the shape of a brain determined the skull shape, and that the shape of a brain could be used to determine personality. So you just had to feel how someone's skull felt to determine if they were crazy or insane or smart or, or whatnot. The idea did gain traction, but it was also widely ridiculed, as can be seen what's in, in this picture here. You can see a lot of people with different skull shapes um, sort of being made fun of here. You can see in the back, people, there's these busts would show like slyness and pride and sleepiness. So the idea of phrenology is that someone with a skull shape like that one labeled sleepiness would be a very sleepy person. And that only people with that skull shape would have a sleepiness personality trait. Um, physician Paul Broca did discover that different parts of the brain had different functions in 1861, which finally killed off phrenology. Um, but it still has somewhat of a lasting legacy and just being ridiculous. <laughs> One of a quick note about phrenology, the American um, post sort of murdered it was named Lorenzo Orson Fowler, and he is also the father of the American Octagon House, which is exactly what it sounds like, a house shaped like an octagon. Eventually, Gall uh, stopped promoting his theory as he felt that belief in phrenology replaced belief in God. So he eventually did sort of disown it in his own special way. Can everyone still hear okay? All good? Yeah, sometimes it's a little bit of a lag, but it always comes back. Okay. Now, Phineas Gage is one of the world's most famous medical patients, and his story is covered in Quackery's chapter on lobotomy. Uh, I won't go into all the detail because, I mean, we're pretty close to lunch. Um, but long story short, he got an iron rod stuck through his skull, um, and he survived. He actually stayed conscious for the whole thing. Um, but it was a big step in the development of the idea of different parts of the brain having different functions, not the shape determining it, but actual the parts itself. Uh, so other topics I covered in quackery that I did not have time to go into, these include ingesting gold and antimony. Antimony is actually a fascinating one. Um, without going into too much detail, it's reusable laxatives. Um, <laughs> which is as bad as it sounds. Um, radiation has also been used historically as medicine to add the exact effects you'd expect. Baths of, of electricity, and it even mentions in quackery that Margaret Thatcher took electric baths. Um, hydrotherapy, which is the idea that water can cure anything. You just like sit in a bath and you'll be cured of cancer or hearing loss or anything, as long as it's good water. There's fasting, has historically been used, a lot of it in months, and snake oil was also covered. Now, the I two other books I want to share real quick. Um, one is called The Sawbones Book. It's called The Horrifying Hilarious Road to Modern Medicine. I, I would say it's more childish, but it's still horrifying, and I don't suggest it for children. <laughs> Um, the other one is a bit more serious. It is, if I can get the thing to move, The Tale of Dual Neurosurgeons by Sam Keen about the history of neuroscience. It is an excellent book if you ever, ever have an interest in that. And one final thing to share 
is I have to put in a shame of self-promotion. For the Friends of Kennesaw Mountain in the quarter one news for 2021, I did an article about medicine at Kennesaw Mountain and Dr. Kerry Cox. He was Cobb County's first physician and was a big believer in the water cure, hydrotherapy. And he had the Rock Springs Water Cure Establishment at the base of Kennesaw Mountain. And there is a link to that I can put in the chat. Give me just one second. And I have read this uh, this article that Andrew wrote. It is really, really good. Um, it was fascinating. I, I wasn't even familiar with hydrotherapy before. And so I really highly recommend you take a, a look at it. Oh, and I wanted to so mention, any... I'm sorry, that um, the Sawbones no, go ahead. book, the Sawbones book, my uh -huh. husband listens religiously to the Sawbones podcast. Um, and he, I'm going to have to get every single one of these books because if he likes the Sawbones book, I bet he's going to love the Quackery book. <laughs> Are there any questions? Um, my, my question is, Andrew, so this is super interesting. How did you get interested in I guess uh, this, because I mean, because you love history, but how did you get interested in mm -hmm. medical books and his, the history of medicine? Well, a while ago, a friend of ours gave me a book on the history of a periodic table by Sam Keane, who wrote the neurosurgeon's book. And I really enjoyed the periodic table book. And I ended up reading all four of Sam Keane's books. So this book, Tale Doing Neurosurgeons, kind of started it. Um, and we were at the William Root House in Marietta. They had quackery. Mm. So we got that there, and that began the curiosity by in bad medicine. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that is, that is so interesting. Um, I think you're going to have fun because in our collections, a lot of our newspapers, you've seen some before, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of ads for very questionable medical remedies and things. So you'll have fun with that. I just wanted to say, this is a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much, Andrew. I, I just want to make a, just a brief comment that I think maybe there's kind of sometimes a fine line between quackery and some actual legitimate um, uh, approaches. And I think uh, it's uh, medicine is an interesting very interesting topic. And it, I, to me, it kind of reflects how the society even views the human being, you know, what is the body? What is the mind? What is, you know, all of these things. And, uh, you know, there's, we, we have research about the placebo effect and, and all of these kinds of things. So just, it's, it, it, I think it's an endlessly fascinating topic and I'm sure we have quackery of course today, but again, there's, uh, you know, sometimes there's actual little gems in, in the quackery um, that, that the, like radiation, you know, of course, you know, we, we use that. And you said that I can't believe it. Leeches are still used today. They are still used today in modern medicine, not frequently. I think the chances of any of us ever having to use leeches is very small, but they are still used by legitimate doctors. Okay, I may never visit a doctor again uh, after hearing that, so. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, yeah, Andrew. I, oh, sorry. No, you go um, ahead. Don't you find it interesting, Andrew, that today the terminology is that uh, doctors practice medicine? So it's still practice, yes, that, right? <laughs> I, I find that a fascinating word to put point. alongside medicine. I had not thought about that before, but that is very bothersome. <laughs> <laughs> that is really interesting. Um, but, and I think, uh, and two, to Tamara's point, I think you're right. This idea of, you know, fine line between quackery and legitimate medicine. I mean, even in our own households, we probably can think of some things that, you know, parents or grandparents had us do that was like, Hmm. Like I remember I struggled with nosebleeds a lot when I was little. And I think I remember my grandma would always put like paper, she'd tear off a paper bag and put it right here. And I, I don't know why, or, or a piece of cardboard or something. <laughs> and she would insist that I, I do that, but I don't know why, but that was something she's like, that's what we need to do. <laughs> One great example is actually, um, this came from that periodic table book. 
Um, there was an old wives' tale in medieval times that silver, copper, and gold um, could help like kill you and would be safe. Um, in fact, the astronomer Tycho Brock had his nose cut off in a duel, and he had his nose recreated in copper so that it would be um, be safe. And of course, it, it sounds like a very ridiculous idea, but scientists discovered in the past 20 years that all three of those elements actually do have healing properties, sort of. They're antibacterial. So this old wives' tale of copper be being help from infection and all that was actually very, very true. Um, and it certainly helped. Interesting. Taco Brock later was killed by, um, he was at a dinner party and needed to use the bathroom. And he felt it would be improper of him to get up and leave. And he continued that for eight hours and it actually killed him. So he had other problems, but. Wow, so interesting. Well, thank you so much, Andrew. We really appreciate it. And we know you're you're very busy. So thank you so much for, um, you know, I, I usually don't give you a lot of time. Like, Andrew, you want to tell us about <laughs> like a day before. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, and I want to transition now to uh, Morgan. Uh, Morgan, can you raise your hand? There we go. There's Morgan. Um, she is our intern or one of our interns uh, for in our department for this spring. And Morgan is an anthropology major. So she's got a very unique perspective and um, is, is really attuned to some things especially in our medical books that I never would have thought of or I hadn't noticed. So Morgan, I would love for you to um, tell us a bit about maybe um, your interest and about some things you noticed because Morgan has been looking at some medical texts that we have in the Bentley collection. Um, and Morgan, I have some images of those things if you need it, um, but if you have your own, that's totally fine. Um, yeah, I have uh, a presentation. Uh, that I can share um, but yeah I was kind of looking more at like the social um, social aspects of medicine um, I'm really fascinated with anatomy and especially bones and like how they uh, like most people think of bones as just being stationary but they actually um and like just they support your muscles and support your body, but actually they do a lot more and um, they form and mold based on like what their needs are. So let's see if I can share my presentation. One second. Oh, Tamika put something in the chat and said the bodies exhibit um, is really interesting. I've never seen that. I've actually been kind of scared to go <laughs> see it. <laughs> I'm so just a scaredy cat, but you recommended it. So I'll have to <laughs> check it out. Yeah, that's something I've been wanting to go to is the, the body exhibit because I think that is just, I think all of this is just like fascinating to learn about. Um, But I wanted to start off with a um, with a little like quiz, like a fun activity. Like, would you survive the Middle Ages? Um, so I can actually, I think I have to stop sharing in order to put this in the chat, or or we can all do it together. Sorry.
Are you able to share it? Uh, yes, I just had to pull it up real quick. Okay. Here we go. So this is um, just a little quiz off of like spark notes. Uh, what would you die of in the Middle Ages? So just, um, just yell out what option you want me to pick. <laughs> If you were living in the Middle Ages, what would be your social class? Peasantry. <laughs> we're up for the challenge, right? A peasantry. <laughs> Is that what I heard? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and what would be your medieval occupation? Well, oh. <laughs> an ale wife. That's what I was going to pick, too. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Your least favorite part of the Middle Ages. The least favorite part of the. <laughs> Tamika says no internet. <laughs> Couldn't read books without getting executed. That's awful. That is pretty bad. Yeah, why not? Yeah, we'll choose that one. Ooh. Hot bread. Love it. Love, love yeah, it. Hot bread. <laughs> 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 um, Let's say last winter. Yeah. A rebel. Would you ever make a pilgrimage to Canterbury? Sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Everybody. everybody, everybody <laughs> I think everybody has. <laughs> I was Andrew like, hasn't. I saw Andrew shake his head. <laughs> that one. Give it time, Andrew. You're still young. <laughs> Between a vassal and a villain. I personally didn't know the difference. Mm. I don't know it. Then say no. <laughs> we could look it up, but oh, oh. No! <laughs> Got burned at the stake. <laughs> I feel attacked. <laughs> I do too. Why? What did we do? <laughs> when you're reading books, it says that's the first thing it lists, right? It yeah. says you read books. Oh no. <laughs> oh well, then yeah. I guess we all would have been then. I mean, we're in this group, so. <laughs> yeah. oh, did 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 I get bread at least? I know. Did we get bread? <laughs> oh my gosh! And in the chat, Stephanie said she she did it and got the plague. <laughs> Stuff. When I did it, I got the plague as well. I was like, oh, <laughs> okay. Oh, oh my. <laughs> um, on the right uh, hand side of the screen is from um, the facsimile of, uh, oh no, I forgot the name of it. Um, oh, day. Hi, Andreas. Morris um, Fabrica Libre Septum. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bentley, uh, I had the privilege of looking at these herbals from 1499 and 1508. I believe these ones are from, these two are the one from 1508 and mm -hmm. on the left, these two are from 1499. And I thought these were super interesting because um, they one is in Latin and one is in German. Um, so the one on... Yeah, the one on the right so, the, is the German. And the one on the left is in Latin. Um, and they were both print, printed and named. German. Oh, Morgan, we can't hear you. Can you get like a little closer? Oh. Sorry. <laughs> um, and they're both printed in Mainz, Germany. And a lot of them quote from like, you can even see it on uh, the page sometimes. I don't know if they're big enough to see or not. But uh, right here, they were on the far right. You can even see Seraphio. So they were 
they were quoted from a lot of like ancient medicine, um, ancient uh, people who taught like ancient medicine. So like Pliny, Galen, uh, Dioscorides, I, if I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, and Sarah Fran. So um, there's a lot of quotes from a lot of things, but they didn't exactly have like uh, authors to them. They were just kind of a collective of multiple different authors. And so an author wasn't listed. I really like the woodcut illustrations on here of like all the different animals and uh, plants. There was plants, animals, and mythical creatures in these. And they were woodcut illustrations so that even if you weren't literate, you could still uh, use these. Morgan, can I say a couple things uh, that's really interesting? I think people will appreciate, especially since you mentioned um, the uh, on the the right, the 1508 Gart de Gesundheit um, was printed <laughs> was printed in Mainz, Germany. Which, if you if you've heard of that before, you'll probably realize that was really the epicenter of printing, where printing began in Europe with Johann jo um, Johannes Gutenberg. But what's interesting is that. Um, I think it was Peter, I think so the, the Garte de Gesundheit was one of the um, very early herbals that were printed in, um, that were, were printed in Germany. And Peter Schoffer uh, printed this. And Peter Schoffer was kind of, um, he was the, I think, son-in-law of Johann or Johannes Fust, who was a partner um, a, a professional business partner with um, Johannes Gutenberg. And until those two, Fust and Gutenberg, had like a terrible legal falling out um, over who invented print in Europe. <laughs> and so um, it's kind of interesting. So we're dealing with here um, some heavy hitters in terms of early printing. And um, I think eventually the Gart de Gesundheit, although we only have one leaf here, it, the full Gart de Gesundheit, I think it had like four, over 400 chapters and over 400 of those, as Morgan mentioned, the woodcut illustrations. So really, really interesting. And then on the left, the Hortus Sanitatis was, was printed later in 1491, even though we have 1499 um, leaf here. So we're, we're seeing here, um, Europe was dealing with a lot, particularly the Black Plague. I mean, people were wondering, how do we stay healthy um, during this time? And uh, so that's why these herbal books um, became really popular. And I think it's interesting, as you mentioned, Morgan, that the Gart de der Gesundheit was printed in German, because normally those kinds of things would be printed in Latin, but it made it and it put it in vernacular language for people. So really, really interesting. <laughs> Yeah, the one on the right was originally published in 1485. So there's like multiple editions of both of these um, in the Latin and in German. And in the 14th century, we had Andreas Basulius. So that's the facsimile um, that we have in the Bentley. And I love the illustrations in, in these books. I think they're just like kind of comical. Uh, so they kind of just made like anatomy lighthearted <laughs> a little bit because he's just like, you know, he's got like a cane and he's just resting there and just like to see like the anatomy of um, the skeletal system and the musculoskeletal system. Um, and Andre Andreas Vesulius, he originally, he was accepted to the Paris Med School, which at that time in 1553, which at that time was um, a really like it probably still is, but that was like one of the best med schools at the time. And um, his uh, professor, uh, Gunter von Ander Andernach, allowed students to participate in the dissections, which was um, uncommon at the time because it was thought of like degrading for like the very educated and um, to handle like dissecting like specimens or dissecting bodies or cadavers. Um, but he also went to Louvain Med School um, because there was a war that just had broken out in France. And a lot of this medicine that they were learning, all the dissections and stuff that they were learning, it was based on 
Galen and Hippocrates. So it was based on like ancient medicine that hadn't been, you know, kind of thought of, like they haven't thought of any new things. Like they were just kind of going like, oh yeah, this is what, you know, um, Galen and Hippocrates said. And Galen and Hippocrates, um, their dice, they did dissections as well, but they did dissections on animals because humans at the time, it was kind of considered like, oh no, that's immoral. Like you can't dissect humans. So they were basically going off of medicine that was based on animals and then trying to translate it to human bodies. So as you can see that, you know, that they weren't as accurate. Um, and Andreas Vesulius kind of challenged this and he was kind of like, I don't think that that's as accurate. And he was elected as a professor of anatomy and surgery um, at the University of Padua. He focused, and what he focused on is creating illustrations. Um, and he also focused more on dissections and kind of just was like, well, how are we expecting expecting these students to like learn if they don't have illustrations to go off of. So he was kind of like, we need illustrations in anatomy and teaching anatomy. And because he was so popular, there's so many plagiarisms of uh, his works and lots of plagiarisms of his works. Um, I just saw one uh, that was being auctioned on um, that one site, Joy Ellen, that you uh, told me about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, he is. It's um, I've it. it well, there's one. I'm going to show y'all one later. Um, you can see the prices of the Vesalius pieces. We're getting into hundreds of thousands of dollars for his his first editions. It is very competitive to get a first edition of, especially day corporate. I can't say it right, de corpor, de humani corporis. <laughs> In the 17th and 18th century, there was a lot of focus on experiments and dissection. Uh, we don't have anything in the Bentley that uh, dates to these uh, two centuries. But I wanted to note that like, some of the experiments was like in electrophysiology, which uh, is thought to be inspiration for uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, because they did, because uh, Luigi Galvani uh, did experiments on frogs and musculature and how that electric shock in, oh, electric shock in musculature makes it like contract. So reanimating flesh was kind of a big, uh, a big topic for experiments during this time. And on the right is a, a nice Rembrandt uh, painting of dissection and anatomy and like a class that was, you know, someone's dissecting and pointing to things and all the students are just watching. So three books that we have in, uh, well, there's more books that date to the 1800s, but these are three of the books that I looked at um, and I wanted to relate them to things that were happening during this period. So uh, the Murder Act of 1752 was an act that just allowed uh, doctors and surgeons to dissect criminals that were put to death. So it kind of two birds, one stone. It allowed medical schools to have um, cadavers to dissect for to increase their knowledge. And it also kind of deterred people from, you know, committing like um, crimes because no one wanted their body to be dissected after they were dead. But as it happens, there was still a rise in a need for a need for cadavers to be um, to be dissected for all these medical schools because there was an influx of medical students, and the Anatomy Act of 1832 um, that allowed for people who donated their body to be dissected as well. 
And in the U.S., uh, both of those were in Great Britain, but in the U.S., there was multiple acts by like individual states. So like Georgia, it was illegal to, de- to have dissections. Um, in Pennsylvania, I believe they had something close to the Anatomy Act where like if you were donated, you could, um, if you wanted to donate your body, which most of the time people would get paid to donate their body, um, paid in life so that upon death, these um, these doctors uh, could dissect their bodies. And so since there was such an influx of medical students and not really and and not really enough cadavers, there was also grave robbing. I don't know. And this uh, these plates or illustrations are from oops. These illustrations are from Dalty's Treatise in Human Physiology, but things that I kind of wanted to point out are that these are illustrations of cadavers, and what I thought was really interesting is that the face is always facing away from, you know, the illustrator, and that their, and that their hands are, like, kind of tied to the table to keep them in place. I thought that was kind of interesting and just, you know, kind of, these are kind of graphic for, you know, for books that were being sold, not only to just medical students. And grave robbing, there's many different names for grave robbers. Uh, There is Night doctors, body snatchers, sack them up men, resurrectionists was very common in um, England. So I guess, so Morgan, didn't you say that some people took some extra security precautions with their coffins? Yeah, some people, primarily the the rich who could afford it, um, had like extra bars on their... um, on their coffins, like iron bars and and stuff that would try to deter um, grave robbers from stealing their body and selling it to medical doctors because they needed like fresh bodies. So it'd be like whenever someone was uh, buried that day, grave robbers would probably go like try to go out and steal their bodies so that they could make a decent amount of money. Um, selling them to these medical schools and these medical doctors are like, I'm not going to ask, like, not going to really ask what's going on. Like, they kind of knew that they were great robbing, but they're just like, they wanted the body so badly so that they could have cadavers to dissect. And so that really, that's like a social issue because what happened is the communities that were most affected obviously weren't rich communities, they were poor communities, African-American communities and immigrants that were most affected by these, especially um, in uh, Georgia, there was Medical College of Georgia and um, grave robbing happens like everywhere all around the US and and Britain, but uh, Medical College of Georgia, which was founded in 1822, and dissections were illegal in Georgia until 1887, but they obtained cadavers um, through multiple different ways. They um, they had some shipped in from New York, so I'm not entirely sure. They shipped them in brine or whiskey, um, and they paid people for once they die, that upon death they would get their body to be able to dissect. I think it said that one person was paid $700 for their body. So that's a, quite a bit of money, especially back then. Um, and also a nearby cemetery uh, was called Cedar Grove Cemetery. That was where they got most of their bodies from. So they would pay someone to go and dig up the bodies um, and bring them to the medical school. And there was a recent excavation of uh, the medical school in 
1989 and the uh, renovators got a, a big surprise when they renovated the basement and they found approximately 9,000 bones in the basement. So they, they had a lot of bones and they had many medical and dissection in instruments um, that were excavated um, and they found, and upon skeletal analysis of the bones, they determined that like most of the bones belonged to African-Americans and European Americans. So the Af African-American community and immigrant communities were greatly affected because they they were one nearby and two, um, it wasn't like a lot of people at that time knew that that was happening and were aware of it, but they weren't, but they weren't worrying about it because it didn't affect white Americans and it didn't affect uh, the rich. And so they didn't really throw a fit about it until it did happen to them. So this went on without any any repercussions for a very long time. And that is very sad and uh, just something that like no one had, you know, really, there was like lighter sentences for grave robbers and they really didn't know how to balance between medical knowledge and basically just being immoral with people's bodies. And so a lot of these inspired um, famous literature. So the electrophysiology um, in the 16 and 1700s um, is said to have kind of influenced um, Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. The two cities, um, there's an, a scene in there where there's uh, grave robbers. Um, and in the adventures of Tom Sawyer, um, Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer um, experience a grave robbing and then experience a murder because uh, the grave robber and the doctor in that story didn't really agree on price. And so the grave robber killed the, murdered the doctor, which kind of sends the plot into them running away. Yeah. And I had another um, activity or quiz. I don't if we have yeah, time we for it. We're, we're gonna go on. I'm so sorry, we don't have time for that one okay. today. Um, okay, but, that's fine. Uh, can you drop it in the chat? Yes, I can. That would be perfect. So I wish we had time. I just wanted to show folks one more thing. That was so interesting, Morgan. And like I said, um, just you being a an anthropology major, I think you have a different, um, because when I looked at, you know, when I looked at those, illustrations before from Illustrated Dissections, uh, that book from 1882 for a class, I would, I don't think I ever really noticed, you know, how they were placed. Um, and so that, that's really interesting that you brought that up. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, I wanted to just uh, ask the group though, does anyone, aside from Andrew, who, you know, told us, does anybody collect medical books or have an interest in collecting medical books maybe? <laughs> Andrew has his, his up. You know, it's one of those things where maybe it doesn't lend itself to like where you think, oh, I'm going to collect that. Um, oh, interesting. So Tamika, you're, that's right. Your mom is a nurse. Um, so she has a lot of them. Um, so they're very interesting to collect. And um, I never really, um, and really Tamara uh, kind of turned me on to that, particularly since um, Tamara's uh, father uh, was or is a scientist. And so it's really interesting. And we actually had a student, uh, I guess it was two years ago now, who's a biology student do a capstone with us through our collection. So very, very interesting stuff. Um, so uh, we, collecting medical literature is something that you can do. And it's, I think Camilla, you kind of um, almost borderline with that because Camilla is interested in culinary history and a lot of the older cookbooks really are household guides that also tell you they give information on how to take care of you know sick children uh sick husbands <laughs> things like that um so yours almost kind of borderline is that 
But I wanted to show you, it's very fascinating sometimes collecting uh, medical literature. I'm just going to show you one picture that I think is really cool. So tomorrow, I think tomorrow went to Atlanta Vintage Books. And um, uh, she found this really cool, she, she texted me and was like, I think we should get this. And um, we, it is so cool. I mean, I um, was looking through it. And I'm just going to show you all just one picture um, or a couple pictures here. This is the rare, med it's a catalog of rare medical books from 1956. So basically, um, I think it was a, from the collection of this Dr. Lundhart here. And then it, it gives you information about all these different books you should collect if you want to be a collector of medical literature or if you're a practicing physician and you want to know the history of your profession. So here's the Vesalius one, the De Humani Corporis. We could, you could get it then for $240. It was being sold, which now I'm going to show y'all what it's worth now, but also look tomorrow. This is the Nehemiah Gru, the anatomy of plants. We have this in our collection, the 1682, and it was available for $55. It's under medical botany. And then I also want to say to, yeah, I just kind of did that. And then medical folklore was also a thing. So um, kind of along the lines of quackery, I guess, but folklore and medicine too, which is pretty cool. And then last thing. Um, oh, Andrew, are you heading out? Yeah. See you in okay. two weeks. <laughs> All right. See ya. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye. bye. Um, last thing I wanted to just show, we saw that, that Andreas Vesalius that uh, Morgan talked about with the, the human anatomy, the first person to really realize, oh, we actually need to dissect humans so we can know what they look like. They're not the same as animals, <laughs> that guy. Um, so very, very rare. Um, his first edition of De Humani Corporis from 1543. Um, this one is, I found one that is currently available. If you want to get it, I will put it in the chat so people can get it if they want to see who wants to not a, just a small price. If you want to pay for this book, <laughs> you can see it's $300,000. <laughs> so, um, if Mr. Williams were here, he'd probably say I should get it. <laughs> I don't think my husband would like that <laughs> if we bought it, but don't worry if you can settle for the 1555 edition, it's only $110,000. I checked. So um, with that, <laughs> with that, I think, you know, as we can see, some of these medical texts can get pretty, pretty expensive, but there are many other uh, medical books that um, you can collect or or even just books maybe from your childhood or or things that your parents used to use, you know, the, things like that are, are fun to collect. And and you, you can see changes in medicinal practices even since then. So sometimes throwing those things away, I mean, you can, but you don't have to. I mean, they're actually very, very interesting. So I wanted to just alert people that some of the medical texts that we use when we were young might want to keep some of those. <laughs> um, they make for really interesting reading later on. And again, some of those remedies might, they still work. They're not all quackery. <laughs> um, all right. Well, uh, thank you all so much for joining us today. I hope it didn't gross you out too much. I know we talked a lot about bodies and dissections, but hey, it's part of being human. Um, all right. So everybody, thank you. And again, we won't meet next week, but then the following week we'll make up for it. It's going to be super duper cool. Um, we're going to have a really fun time. So thank you guys again. Great to see everybody today. Okay. <laughs> Bye.